Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be able to welcome you here in this building to worship this morning. Uh, and on a, a really good day as well, the day of Pentecost, when we Pentecost Sunday, when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm afraid that we, are, we will not be able to gather after the service in the hall as usual, as is our custom because of uh, COVID, and I uh, have to ask you to uh, uh, leave after service. Uh, when you leave, um, I'm sure you're all well aware of the government, uh, government's rules about safe distancing. So please, as you go out, uh, make sure you don't crowd the, neighbor, the um, other people in the, in the service. And particularly so uh, when you come down to the uh, lobby, because there will be people coming down the stairs as well. So if somebody's coming down the stairs, um, uh, behave as if you would or if you're on an airline and make sure that people uh, people don't have to push in or push past. Uh, Tony Evans has asked to give you one notice about safeguarding training. Um, if you're due to have safeguarding training, you should already know this because he will have sent you a message but he wanted me to remind those people who have not yet had training that there is now only one opportunity left for online training, and that is on 14th of June at 6.30. So if you haven't had training yet, uh, please put that in your diary. And if you want to know why safeguarding is important, I suggest you read the front page of this week's Beacon. It will tell you some of the problems that it's intended to avoid. Um, I found a lovely little prayer uh, which Chesney gave me a while ago, which I think is particularly appropriate today. I will read that, have a short period of silent prayer, and then Reverend Bethany... Uh, will lead us in our service of worship. So let us pray. God, may the Holy Spirit shake us up so that our fear becomes courage, our apathy becomes enthusiasm, our indifference becomes commitment, our service becomes a time of deep worship, and our life in the world becomes a powerful witness. We pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, silent prayer. Amen. Well, it is good to be back here, although I'm not entirely sure I know how to do this anymore. <laughs> I know when we were starting online, I told Joel, oh, I want to go back to in-person. It's so much easier. And now that I've gotten used to online, whew, this seems harder. <laughs> but I am glad to be here and to see all of your uh, smiling eyes. <laughs> I can't see your smiles, but <laughs> glad to have you here with us for this Pentecost, whether you are in the building or on Zoom, or on Facebook. Hopefully, if all of our technology worked right this morning, uh, we are glad to have you worshiping with us. And the Holy Spirit will unite us, no matter how we gather together. So will you join me in this call to worship? God declares, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And how fitting that we have the wind literally blowing through our worship space this morning, as it is a beautiful symbol of the Holy Spirit. 
So let us listen uh, as Caroline plays for us, and I will try to sing, uh, Wind of God, Dynamic Spirit, number 400 in Singing the Faith. love the start of that last verse, fire of God, volcanic spirits. What, what an illustration of the Holy Spirit. Will you be with me in a spirit of prayer? Faithful God, you fulfilled the promise of Easter by sending your Holy Spirit and opening the way of eternal life to all the human race. Keep us in the unity of your Spirit that every tongue may tell of your glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now I invite Dorothy Lloyd-Williams to come before us to read from the Gospel of John. So she'll read from John chapter 15 verses 26 and 27, and then chapter 16, verses 4b through 15. And this is Jesus speaking to his disciples on the night of the Last Supper. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father... The Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify, because you have been with me from the beginning. But I have said these things to you so that their hour, when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth.
It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and justice. Because about sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and will see him, and you will see him, me, no longer. And about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Amen. Thank you, Dorothy. Our next hymn is number 391 in Singing the Faith. O breath of life comes sweeping through us. I encourage you to listen to the piano and to read the words on the screen as we share in this hymn. Second verse, O wind of God, come bend us, break us, till humbly we confess our need. Then in your tenderness remake us, revive, restore, for this we plead. Beautiful words in that hymn. Now I invite Jean Morgan to come forward, and she will share with us these words from the book of Acts. And this is the traditional story of Pentecost, what happened on that day when the disciples were gathered together 50 days after Easter. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, 
They were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a, cra a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own na native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Ly Libya na near S Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who are in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Above and sign, sorry, I will show, show wonders of the heavens above and signs of the earth below, blood and fire and billions of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jean. Will you be with me now in a spirit of prayer of confession? There will be words on the screen, and I invite you to join me when the words are in yellow. So let us pray together. God of wind, word, and fire, we bless your name this day for sending the light and strength of your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks for all the gifts, great and small, that you have poured out upon your children. Holy and wondrous God, we confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbor. Your spirit gives light, but we have preferred darkness. Your spirit gives wisdom, but we have been foolish. Your spirit gives power, but we have trusted in our own strength. Let us take a few moments now in silence to confess our own sins to God. And let us continue with these words together. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, forgive our sins and enable us by your Spirit to serve you in joyful obedience to the glory of your name. There is now no condemnation for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Thanks be to God. And our next hymn has these beautiful words about inviting the breath of God to be upon us. So as that...
cold wind blows, just imagine that that is the breath of God upon you this morning. So this is number 370 in Singing the Faith. Loving and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. I love a good celebration of a holiday. If there is any reason to eat special food, wear something particular, or participate in any kind of tradition, I am all over it. And that is perhaps one of my favorite things about moving to a new country, all of the new holidays that I now get to celebrate. (laughs) Now, in addition to keeping my American holidays, such as Thanksgiving and the 4th of July, I get to celebrate new to me things like Bonfire Night and St. David's Day. The more holidays that I can collect and celebrate, the better. So if there are any obscure British holidays that I need to know about, please be sure to tell me. (laughs) So it should come as no surprise that I love this day in the church that is indeed a special holiday. And this one comes around every year precisely 50 days after Easter, the day of Pentecost. Now of the major Christian holidays, this is one of the less well-known. Unlike Christmas and Easter, it hasn't really been embraced by our secular consumer culture. There are no traditional decorations to put up at home. There are no gifts that we have to buy and give or special meals to be shared. We don't even get a day off of work to celebrate. (laughs) And yet, it is a very important day in the life of the church that should rank right up there with Christmas and Easter. One theologian I know put it this way, Christmas is irrelevant without Easter, and Easter is pointless without Pentecost. Now, while that might be phrasing it a bit harsher than I would myself, I do see their point. Without Pentecost, it's possible no one would know to celebrate Easter, and without Easter, it's likely no one would care to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So what exactly is Pentecost, and what are we celebrating on this day? At Christmas, we know that we celebrate the gift of the birth of Jesus. And at Easter, we know we celebrate the gift of the resurrection of Jesus. Well, here on Pentecost, we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit, 
This gift from the Father that Jesus repeatedly promised to his followers. And finally, now on this day, a little over a week after Jesus ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, the Spirit now descends upon the people left behind in quite a dramatic fashion. Now, over the centuries, it has become tradition to celebrate Pentecost as the birthday of the church. And in the first church where I served as a minister, I worked with someone named Nicole, who was the director of our Christian education programs. And like me, Nicole loves a holiday and is always ready to go all out in celebration of anything and everything. So the two of us together, well, we really embraced the idea of Pentecost as the birthday of the church. And so every year on Pentecost, between our two services on Sundays, we would throw a traditional birthday party, complete with streamers and pointy hats, and of course, a birthday cake with candles. Lots of candles, of course, because fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, if it were safe for us to gather and share tea and food together after the worship service, I would have surprised you all this year with a birthday cake for us to share. But since we still need to be very careful with things like that, I conspired with Liz Ellis to make sure that everyone who's here in person got their own little Pentecost birthday cupcake. (laughs) After all, how can we celebrate a birthday without at least a little bit of cake? (laughs) Now, while going all out with birthday-themed celebrations for Pentecost is perhaps a bit cheesy, It does point to something important if we pause to think about what a birthday usually celebrates. When we celebrate the birthday of an individual, whether it's Jesus' birthday on Christmas, or a brand new baby in the family, or when we celebrate a landmark year like someone's 80th, we are celebrating the life of a person. We celebrate that a new life was brought into this world and we usually take time to acknowledge the impact this life has had on ourselves and the world around us. So if we consider that on Pentecost, the church was born, then we learn something about what the church is meant to be. So let's return to our scripture reading from Acts to dig a bit deeper. The story opens with the disciples of Christ and other followers all gathered in one place in Jerusalem. And I imagine they were feeling a bit lost. After all, the world as they knew it had changed. They had spent three years following Jesus and being in ministry with him. And then they went through the the trauma and the subsequent elation of what we now call Holy Week and Easter. And after the resurrection, they spent 40 days with the risen Christ, off and on, as he appeared to them in various places and continued to preach and teach and lead them. And then the ascension came, and Jesus was gone. Suddenly, they felt like they were left alone. Everything that they had come to count on, everything they had gotten used to about how they lived their lives, changed in an instant. They no longer had Jesus physically present with them, leading and guiding them. And so they were going to have to figure out how to respond to and live into this massive change. So to start, they simply followed Jesus' final instruction when he told them to wait in Jerusalem. To wait, and they would receive the gift the Father promised. And that that passage that Dorothy read for us is one of many instances where Jesus told them that the gift of the Spirit, the Counselor, the Teacher, the Advocate, would be coming. But I doubt the disciples had any idea exactly how that Spirit would arrive. Theologian Frederick Buchner once called the Holy Spirit the shy member of the Trinity. After all, we do tend to give a lot more attention to God the Father and God the Son, and sometimes we forget about God the Holy Spirit. 
But any notion of shyness or staying in the background went out the window on the day of Pentecost. On that day, the Spirit came down in the blowing of a violent wind. And then divided tongues of fire came to rest on each of those gathered. And they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them, in other languages. And a crowd began to gather, people who were amazed at what they were seeing. Galileans speaking not in their own native tongue, but in the languages of those gathered around. One of the first gifts of the Holy Spirit was this gift of communication, of understanding, of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in a new and accessible way. So if we consider this to be the birth of the church, then we see that what the church ultimately is, is people filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit. There was no building built on that day. There was no church hierarchy or administration established. There was no liturgical calendar given or ministers ordained. There was no label of Catholic or Anglican or Baptist or Evangelical or Methodist. There was simply the people born into new life, baptized by the fire of the Holy Spirit, sharing the word of God. That is the essence of the church. And that is what we celebrate on Pentecost. Now it is often said that the only constant in life is change. Of the many, many things the Holy Spirit does and empowers us to do, one of those things is to help us with change. I believe the Holy Spirit both helps us to bring about change and helps us weather the change that is sometimes thrust upon us. On that first Pentecost, when the Spirit arrived, it came to help the disciples deal with the change of Jesus leaving and to help them begin their work of changing the world. And now, 2,000 years later, we can look back and see all the ways the church has changed over the millennia since that first day of Pentecost. Now we do have buildings, everything from small rural chapels to grand soaring cathedrals. Now we do have dozens of varieties of church hierarchies and sometimes seemingly endless tasks of administration. Now we do have a liturgical calendar that reminds us to celebrate things like Pentecost and ordain ministers who spend a lifetime helping to lead people in the ways of Christ. Now we do have all those labels of Catholic and Anglican and Baptist and Evangelical and Methodist, and sometimes we give more weight to those labels than perhaps we should. All of these are things that we might say help make up what the church is today. And all of these things sometimes help us to be the church. And if we are honest, all of these things sometimes hinder us from being the church. If the church is meant to be a people on fire with the power of the Holy Spirit, I wonder sometimes if we haven't allowed our fire to grow dim to burn down to mere embers, or sometimes to be doused altogether. John Wesley once said this about the people called Methodist. My fear is not that our great movement known as the Methodist will eventually cease to exist or one day die from the earth. My fear is that our people will become content to live without the fire, the power, the excitement, the supernatural element that makes us great. In other words, Wesley feared not that Methodism would go away or die out, but that Methodism would someday exist without the fire of the Holy Spirit. And a church without the power of the Holy Spirit, well, that would be like a birthday without cake. What's the point? On this day of Pentecost, 
on this day of celebration of the new life of the church, of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, we are invited once again to reclaim that gift of the Spirit as one that we have been given for all time. We can ask for that breath of life to come sweeping through us once more. And we can cling to the Holy Spirit to help us navigate all of the continued change and upheaval in our lives. Over the past year and a half, we have seen the church change in ways we never expected. As we left our buildings and stayed in our homes to keep each other safe, we came up with creative new ways to worship and stay in community together. And even now, as we begin to gather in person again, it still looks different than it used to, with masks and distancing and refraining from singing to keep others safe. And now we have this big change of, of trying to do hybrid worship, where we have some here in the building and some on Zoom and some on Facebook, and there will be glitches and difficulties as we go along. But in all of it, the Holy Spirit is enabling us to gather and to get through this change. In the days and weeks to come, we will continue to navigate change. And some will be changes that we know are coming and are grateful for as restrictions ease and new rules and regulations come into play. Some will be changes that we don't see coming or never expected. Some will be welcome changes, and others will be not so welcome. But in all of it, the Holy Spirit will be with us to help us instigate needed change and navigate unexpected change. I once heard someone ask this question. Are we willing to follow the Spirit, even if we don't know where the Spirit is leading us? And I hope the answer to that is yes, because we don't always get to know where the Spirit is leading us. We don't always even like where the Spirit is leading us. But if we listen and learn and allow it, the Spirit will guide us in being the church the way that God is calling us to be right now. The church is the people of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, following Jesus Christ in the world. That will never change. The ways we live that out, that will always change. So on this day, let us celebrate the birthday of the church. On an individual's birthday, we celebrate the life of a person. On the birthday of the church, we celebrate the life of a people. And we would not be the people we are today without the gift of the Holy Spirit. So let's celebrate with a little bit of cake, maybe some pointy hats and streamers when you get home if you have them. But definitely with giving praise to God and empowered by the Holy Spirit, continuing to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the world. May it be so. Amen. Now I invite us to sit and listen to this next song called Holy Spirit, Inspire Again.
Be together in a spirit of prayer. Gracious God, whose spirit helps us in our weakness and guides us in our prayers, we pray for the church and for the world in the name of Jesus Christ. Renew the life and faith of the church, strengthen our witness, and make us one in Christ. Grant that we and all who confess that Christ is Lord may be faithful in your service and filled with the Spirit, that the world may be turned to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, may you guide the nations in the ways of justice, liberty, and peace and help them to seek the unity and welfare of all people. Give to all in authority wisdom to know and strength to do what is right. God, we lift up in particular places in this world that are warring, struggling with violence, forgetting the humanity of the people around them. May your Holy Spirit come into those places and bring change that is so desperately needed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we ask that you would comfort all those who are in sorrow. You would heal those who are sick in body or in mind. And deliver all those who are oppressed. And may you grant us compassion for all who suffer and help us so to carry one another's burdens that we may fulfill the law of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our thanks and praise, O God, for all who have served you faithfully here on earth and especially those who revealed to us your grace in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us take a few moments now in silence together to lift up our own personal prayers to God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift all these things to you in the name of Jesus Christ. We know that you hear all of our prayers, whether spoken or left unspoken, for you know all that is on our hearts and minds. We bring these things to you this day and lay them at your feet. And we pray all things through the name of Jesus Christ. And we pray together as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. And if we were in normal times, now would be the time that we would bring forth our offering and bless it. Uh, But we won't do that physical part of moving the offering, but there are uh, places at the back of the church where you can leave an offering if you would like, or you can do so uh, in other ways. But let's pray a blessing over these offerings. Living God, you are the Lord of all. Only you can send your spirit to bring us new life. You graciously speak your word of hope in times of struggle and uncertainty and in times of joy and peace. We are grateful that you are continually at work in our lives and the world to fulfill your promises. May our giving this day show our trust in you. May these gifts be put to work to do your work in this world. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn is number 682 in Singing the Faith. I invite you to listen to the piano and to read these words. Of God of grace and God of glory. May God grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. And may the fire of the Holy Spirit burn so brightly in you that others will be drawn to the light. And let us say these words of the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.